I, I think I should start with um, a declaration of interest and a declaration that clarifies my position. First of all, uh, I am the chairman of the Haymarket Publishing Group, and uh, we do publish planning and regeneration, and so we have a deep interest uh, commercially. Uh, the second point I want to make is that I'm not here to speak for the Conservative Party. Uh, I do not know what the Conservative Party policies will be on regeneration, and therefore there can be no headlines about criticizing my party or splitting anybody or anything of that sort. This is personally a view that I hold, and I alone am responsible for it. I'm sorry to bore you with this, but uh, uh, I've learned the hard way that the slightest uh, deviation and uh, somehow or other one finds oneself back in the headlines. Um, now, regeneration. I have had the privilege of being involved uh, in a very long period of time. I was eight years in the Department of Environment, six of them as Secretary of State. Indeed, I, I was one, I'm one of three Secretaries of State ever to go back to a government department uh, twice. Uh, the first uh, was um, David Young, who went to the DTI twice, uh, Peter Mandelson, who's been to the DTI twice, um, and before that, um, um, uh, David Eccles, who went to the Ministry of Education twice. Um, the problem about uh, regeneration is that, uh, by and large, you're looking at a circumstance that has negative value. Uh, if it had a commercial possibility, you wouldn't be talking about any government role or anything of that sort. It would happen. The market would involve itself. But where politicians become involved, where regeneration becomes something, a part of politics, is because there is a circumstance that is uncompetitive. And uh, it may, in the simplest, and in the early 80s this was very generally the case, it may simply be toxic land. Uh, and uh, you cannot expect a commercial company faced with the choice of a green field or a piece of toxic land to put their money into toxic land. And uh, so one was faced with the obvious uh, challenge uh, that one had to get rid of the negative value. Uh, the second consequence of uh, negative value, of course, is a more human one, that uh, people won't go and live there. And indeed, perhaps even more worrying, that anyone who has the choice, and two sorts of people have the choice, they've either got the money or the skill or both, people who have the choice either don't go there, or if they are there because they're the children of uh, elderly people, uh, they leave. And so you get this vicious circle of decline. And uh, what we were um, deeply involved in in the early 80s was to try to take out the negative value. And there were, there were big schemes and there were small schemes. The biggest of them all, of course, was the Urban Development Corporation in London, which was seen as a centralizing process. And in some respects it was, although it has to be said that a very large part of the land that was involved was owned by the nationalized industries, most of the rest by the local authorities. And um, there had really been only public sector development or no development for most of the post-war period. So creating a development corporation that uh, had private sector rep meant representation in the form of Nigel Brokes as chairman, uh, Bob Menish, a former Labour minister as deputy chairman, and then a balance between private sector and local authority leaders was an agency of central government, but it was very sensitive to the need to involve the local authorities. And I think it is widely re recognized that as an exercise in regeneration, it was successful the one thing that I think is also important to remind people about is that if I had stood here in 1979 and I said, I'd said to you, look, uh, we're going to have a regeneration in, uh, uh, in East London, it's going to be called an Urban Development Corporation, and within a matter of a few years we would see one of the world's greatest financial centre regeneration. Uh, we will also see a new airport built there. Oh, and by the way, the Malaysians will put up a major exhibition, um, conference center and uh, exhibition center. Um, uh, people would have thought that one was certifiable. 
So there is a very significant degree of chance, of vision, of hope in the regenerative process. You cannot be sure what will happen if you try to uh, um, predict uh, the consequence of getting rid of the negative value. You can believe there will be consequences, you cannot easily predict them. And I certainly would add to my examples that if when we took the decision to bring the uh, channel, high-speed channel link into um, St Pancras uh, and stopping at, uh, uh, we hope, at, at Stratfield, Stratford, that anyone would have believed it would lead to the decision to bring the, 19, the 2012 Olympics to London, which of course it did. It was an opportunity, but no one knew how it would work out. On the other end of the scale, much smaller in the early 80s, we were usually dealing with single land sites, um, and, and th that was not a new policy of the then Conservative government. Where we, I think, I know, did change the nature of the policy was by the concept of gearing. That instead of saying to a local authority, you can clean up that piece of land, and there you go, we said you can clean up that piece of land providing you have an arrangement with the private sector that they will do something with it. And the first and obvious example, of course, was the partnerships with the housing industry. That, uh, okay, we will clean the negative value out of this site through local government support from central government, but um, we would then get the knowledge that a significant extra sum of money from the private sector would be spent. And I happen to remember from the early days the, the consequences of this gearing in Liverpool, the hardest, most intractable problem of regeneration at that time, we got £1.50 for every public pound we spent. Well, it's still a significant enhancement. In London, in the development corporation, we got £10 for every pound of public money. And that tells you quite a lot about the balance of the British economy. But the, the point about the gearing is that we did establish that as a conditionality of grant in the early 80s. It also had another fascinating um, consequence, because in the 70s, this was a deeply divided country, and by and large, the uh, private sector did not work easily with the public sector. And the, I, I use language which is characteristically modest, but uh, uh, those of you who would remember those times would know that the way in which the public and private sector talked about each other was a, a degree less modest than I have used this afternoon. But because of the linkage that we forged through the gearing process, they became colleagues at least, and often friends. And so the concept of the public and private sectors working together in regeneration became a, a reality born of mutual advantage. Now, what is the essential ingredient, therefore, in my view, of regeneration? Well, the first is leadership. It is people in charge who see and want to pursue the opportunities. And the second is a degree of resource to finance the initial stages which can then themselves create the opportunities. 